Okay. Welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to say I've got uh, Mike Pruitt, the CEO of Emergent Hospitality Group, uh, with us today. I've been in touch with Mike. I think, Mike, we must be going back best part of a year now at this stage. Um, and I thought Mike's, I guess, long and diverse career uh, in funds management, uh, running companies, doing deals, M&As, uh, would be a very interesting conversation and might offer up some insights to uh, some of the Australian microcap investors Mike's based in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, Mike, why don't you give us a bit of an overview of your background and, and where you've kind of wound up at where you are today? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. And you know, yes, I've been following you for more than a year. I appreciate and admire what you're doing. Anybody who's committed to you know, bringing awareness to the microcap space is certainly uh, much appreciated. You know, you know, my background is really, I went to college on a baseball scholarship. I was very fortunate to play in two college world series, got a business degree, you know, and then my started out in sales, you know, basically selling for 3M Corporation. And then, you know, was fortunate enough, you know, 20 years ago to be recruited into a company to build a sales force that was ultimately sold to a public company. So that was my first experience with the public markets was in 1998. We sold our private company to a public company. We took shares in the public company. We couldn't sell them for a year. And I, I always remember Mark coming home and my, telling my wife, they, they offered me a job. I didn't want to move to Seattle. I had some young kids, lived in Charlotte, really enjoyed it. And so, you know, they gave me a 90 day transition agreement. I came home with a stock certificate and said to my wife, you know, look, I got this stock certificate that's worth $750,000. And she looked at me and she said, well, the last time I checked the grocery store doesn't accept, you know, stock certificates. What are we going to do for the next 12 months that you can, uh, you know, you know, pay our way. So luckily um, the, the investors in that deal, because they, you know, it, made money and appreciated, they basically offered to back me to start a company to go look for investments on their behalf. And so, and to make it even more fortunate, by the time we could sell the stock one year later, it went up sevenfold. So those original investors, you know, walked away with somewhere between 75 and a hundred million dollars worth of stock that they could sell. And unlike a lot of stories in the market, the stock kept going up even though they were selling. So it really turned out to be fortuitous. And so they came to me and said, listen, you know, you know, we don't want to pay you a management fee because we know you made money as well. Um, but, you know, we want you to go find investments. So I'm a diehard Warren Buffett guy. So Warren Buffett's original partnership model was no management fee. First 6% yearly goes to the investor. He got 25% above that 6% hurdle rate. So I went back to them. They said, deal. And so I spent the next 10 years, you know, building a network of about 40 families that would put anywhere from 50,000 to a million dollars in deals. And we were that three to $10 million equity check. And and then one of those deals that we ultimately ended up doing was a $5 million convertible. I typically did convertibles and preferreds to cover that hurdle, right? So ultimately when there was an exit, I truly got 25%. And so we did a deal with the Hooters restaurant chain. The founder was a dear friend, a mentor. He wanted to take Hooters public, didn't know how to do it. And so he, we did a $5 million convertible note into Hooters and we spent six months working with his CFO and people to at least put them in a position to have conversations with investment banks. And we had the first week of conversations and that Saturday he dropped that of a brain aneurysm at 69 years old. And he had written in the documents that if something ever happened to him, he gave me the right of first refusal to buy the company, not his own son who was president of Hooters. So we put together a private equity partner and our families, we ultimately converted 
and bought Hooters from the family for over $200 million. And so that led me to the restaurant, you know, space, which is where, you know, Emergent Hospitality Group is focused on in terms of at least one big component of my time and energy and uh, building out this platform of Emergent Hospitality Group. Okay. Why don't you just give us a quick overview of yeah, what Emergent does, where it operates, um, you know, it, is it in the quick service space or full service restaurant? Um, just give people an idea of uh, where 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 it sits in the in the in the restaurant market. So originally, when it was Shana Clear Holdings, uh, our original focus was to take our stake that we own in the parent company of Hooters. I sat on the board of the parent company of Hooters, which you know, like I say, we we paid over two hundred million dollars for, and we had some international rights to Hooters. So we had South Africa, the UK, and and so that was an area of focus. We made a decision back in 2014 when, you know, the fast casual better burgers concept you know, sort of came to fruition to, you know, focus in that space. And so we bought four regional chains that were in the better burger space. And our view and the research that we did is very difficult to build a national chain. And so we, you know, the young millennial consumer likes, you know, regional where you're part of the community, you have unique, you know, items on the menu that correlate to that area of the country. And so we bought four of those concepts, two in Charlotte, one in the DC market, and then one up in the Pacific Northwest called Little Big Burger, which is our biggest concept now. And so that's that's our focus. We still own a sliver of, you know, the Hooters parent company. We still have the Hooters in the UK and one in the US that has gaming attached to it, which has been very profitable. And, but primarily we're in the better, fast casual, better burger segment is our core focus okay and we did a transaction to, just so to come clear because shana clear holdings was the public company up until april of last year and we did a merger and we spun out the restaurant assets and at the time we got six million in cash in from the spin out with no dilution and two million dollars worth of warrants in the company that we we merged with and we changed the name to Emergent Hospitality Group. Okay, all right. Um, if we can backtrack to your kind of time as a microcap um, fund manager, can you give us an idea of, I guess you say you're a, a Buffett follower, Munger follower, you know, is it very much focused on, on value uh, or what was the kind of strategy you were, you, you were following in those days? So when we first started, you know, again, I had these families, we were doing one-off deals, you know, in that three to $10 million equity check type deals. Uh, I had hired two young guys right out of college in 2005 as analysts. And because the professor at, at Coastal Carolina uh, was a diehard Buffett guy, he taught value investing as a, as, you know, in school. I ran into him at a baseball game and he said, Hey man, if you're looking for two, you know, some analysts, I got two kids that are the best I've seen come through here in 30 years. And so I'm like, wow, really? I said, well, I don't know that I'd be looking for two, but I potentially would do one and ended up interviewing both of them and couldn't decide between the two of them because they were both good in different ways, but had the same passion. I hired both of them. And so when they were working as analysts looking at private equity more type deals you know they're you know we were doing one or two deals a year and so they had approached me to say hey you know why don't we look at micro cap public equity because some of them are a lot like private equity other than they're public and so I put those two young men through hell you know trying to prove to me that they really knew what they were doing so I'd make them write white papers on an investment and then we'd invest $5,000 in it just to watch it and see what they were doing. And so um, 
in the end, we spent about 18 months doing it that way. And then on January 1st of 2007, we created a fund and I reached out to our families. And in the end, we had about $7 million in the fund. And the focus was micro cap value strategy. And so, but we, we looked at value as, you know, not necessarily there wasn't a growth component to it. It's just that we were paying less than we thought the value of it should be trading at. So, and having the experience where we were doing private equity deals, you know, we looked very much at what we would buy the company for and then back into, you know, the stock in terms of the percentage. And so, but we were, you know, very fortunate, you know, those two young men, you know, did, you know, turned out to be amazing. You know, they studied all the best investors out there and always looked at what they were doing and tried to understand why. And then we did, and, you know, and, and the track record, you know, we ended up running that fund from January 1, 2007 through June 30 of 2013. And, you know, to our investors of which I was, I was one as well, we returned after fees 14% a year compounded versus the market at the time, both the Russell 2000 and the S&P were about 4% for that same period of time. So we did really well. Uh, we got an institutional investor. It was spun out in the two young guys went off to run it. And so we kept an economic participation in it, but they, you know, they, they went off to run it and that strategy and trying to clear focus on the restaurant space. And uh, yeah, I mean, you were in kind of pre the financial crisis, invested through that crisis and kind of caught the recovery on the other end. So, I mean, no mean feat to still have 14% after you know, going through a, a major dislocation, because uh, I, I often find with the, you know, I guess a track record, it's as much about how you manage through the, the big bear market, but also how much of the, the upswing you get in those kind of first two or three years coming out of a bear market, the, you know, it's a, it can be it's a combination of the two that actually goes into the track record, not, you know, missing the bear market, uh, but then also missing the big run up or vice versa. Well, you know, it's funny when I look back at that, when you bring up 2008, um, there was a point where I literally went to the two young guys and said, you know, I don't know that, you know, we can, we can survive this because, you know, there was, you know, we were down 40% at one point. And, you know, so there was no management fees going to be because we weren't going to make the 6%. Nice. And so I looked at the two of them and I it actually I said, if you'll take a 50% pay cut, you know, I'll give you equity into the business. And I said, think about it over the weekend. But if your answer is no, I don't know what, what we're, what we're going to do here. And they came to me on that after the weekend and said, you know, Mr. Pruitt, if we take a 50% pay cut, we'll only make $25,000 a year. We can't pay our rent. We can't pay our bills. So we may have to go find another job. And I took $100,000 out of a place that I swore I'd never touch um, and put it in there and said, all right, let's, let's, let's grind through it. Um, and what's even really more amazing on the returns that we ended up achieving is we were fully invested. And there was no way you were going to get a new investor to give you any money in 2008. So we really didn't take advantage of buying things that we knew were winners you know, on the downside to really maximize the upside coming out. We just were fortunate that in 2009 and beyond, the market realized that what we owned was really good. And so we really could have achieved even greater returns back then if we had more capital yeah well, i think also that was, that was yeah i think it was also a function of you know what you held in 2008 that uh you know it didn't go bankrupt in 2008 so i think you know the groundwork you had done probably beforehand mm -hmm. then stood to you in 9 10 11 when the market realized actually you know this is a pretty decent business has come through 08 and you know be that last yeah. man standing kind of uh scenario um, in terms of, you know, that period with, you know, the analysts and, you know, more of the kind of standard, I guess, 
portfolio manager, fund manager, micro cap thing. I mean, obviously, you've probably, t- and even in the private equity things, I mean, you've spoken to a lot of CEOs, um, CFOs, management teams, chairmen. You know, what are some of the lessons from that period, you know, coming ahead from an, an investment point of angle that you're applying today as like a CEO when you're dealing with, you know, investors, it, you know, investor relations, PR for emergent, um, if, you, if, you know, from having that experience? Well, you know, it, it's interesting because it's really even more than that, right? Because... I also, I sit on the board of a foundation for the last 15 years and I'm on the investment committee and at one point even chair of the committee and that's gone from 15 million and grown to over 60 million. So interviewing, you know, managers, evaluating, you know, alternative investments and stat strategy and looking at that endowment mentality of how, you know, Yale and Harvard, we constantly are getting, you know, information, you know, and how to manage our you know, endowment. And then to your point, the private equity world, I typically did more private equity type transactions. And truth be told, even today, although we're public, you know, emergent is in some ways, you know, we still try to operate on a private equity mentality of creating value, value that you can easily explain. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I've had, I've hired three interns over the last year. In, in including you know the last month and really been fascinated because you know Warren Buffett likes to always say that as a public company in the end you always get the shareholders you deserve and so you know how do you try to attract the best shareholders and that's in part explaining what you intend to do how you intend to you know capital allocate capital and ultimately what's the end result you're trying to achieve. And some things, you know, you're never gonna win. There's gonna be investors that still will look at it and say, that's not for me. And I I certainly respect and get that. But, you know, I ask myself every day why, and then be able to explain that why. And we've been fortunate. I mean, we have two family offices that between them own over 30%. They understand the why, has it been an easy road? Whew, no. Has it been difficult and, you know, COVID's made it even more difficult? Absolutely. But there are also people who understand business is hard. And, you know, and the key is being selfless, relentless in your effort to get to the other side. So, you know, that's the one thing that, you know, when we were managing money, we were always fascinated by, I'd say, a very high percentage of the micro cap that value oriented aims spent little to no money on you know market awareness telling their story they sort of subscribe to the old baseball movie here you know if you build it they will come and so you know that i found interesting you know in their approach and look some of them it works some of them they find a great investor who tells that story and other great investors buy it and ultimately value is created. But I subscribe to, you know, you, you, you really do need to tell your story and, uh, and every day to new people because things change. And, um, and so it's, uh, so that's the one thing, you know, we probably learned from the micro cap management days and what I try to do differently today. Yeah. Cause I, uh, I think, yeah, I can't remember where I read an article, but it was a guy who was in sales, but he said, uh, you know, you, you always got to be selling, not in a completely overt, direct way, but, you know, always have, if you're speaking to somebody, oh, yeah, no, we run this like burger chain or whatever, you know, he he very subtly like got his kind of product in, in people's minds, even though they might never buy it, but he, you know, he just got it out there. And I think one of the things I've, you know, learned, you know, being in the micro cap space for the last eight years or whatever is, you know, people People will buy uh, buy large cap stocks, but you you got to sell them a micro cap stock. Uh, you know, it's like the Wolf of Wall Street. You know, you, you're never going to get in trouble for for you know buying Disney. Um, but you know, for for the vast vast majority of micro cap stocks, you know, you really got to sell that strategy and 
uh, value potential to an investor before they're going to commit to you. And I think, you know, from the sounds of what you're saying is, you know, you've got to have a clear strategy that, uh, and be able to articulate the, the value opportunity to investors um, and actually communicate. That, that is the, one of the main things. You know, you know, I've had the luxury and, and opportunities. I've met Peter Lynch a number of times. And, you know, one of the things, and we put it in a white paper. And it's funny because I told him this story the first time I talked to him. We wrote a white paper back on the microcap space when we had our fund. And we put in there, you know, one of Peter's quotes, which is stocks go up for one of only two reasons. Little companies start growing up to be big companies or companies being run poorly start being run well. And so... You know, I do think, you know, most companies that are as large caps, mid caps or small caps today, you know, started out in some point in their life is, is a, what would be deemed a micro cap. I mean, when you look at the micro cap space, even Hooters, you know, which we paid 200 and some million dollars for. Think about that. I mean, here's a guy that never had indoor plumbing until he went to Clemson on an agricultural scholarship. You know, we handed this family, you know, 200 and some million dollars for that business. You know, that's quite a legacy. And, you know, but that still is deemed a micro cap, you know, even in that at that level. So, you know, it's but, you know, small companies, you know, grow up to be big companies. And, you know, it's you got to tell your story and, you know. Because you know, I, one of the guys I have great admiration for, he's an investor of mine. He was in Jack Welch's book as one of the five guys that could run GE if Jack got hit by a bus. And he told me, you know, a long time ago before when he invested with us, is that as a public company CEO, if you're not going to use your currency to raise capital to grow faster than you could organically, that's assuming the business justifies that the return on capital is there or to do a creative acquisition, then why would you ever be public? And so then secondly is when you are public, you need someone that runs the business and you really do need someone who is focused on the public company because it is in itself a business. And so, you know, I've subscribed to that in Emergent. We have Fred Glick who runs as the president of Emergent and he is an unbelievable, passionate, you know, proven winner to run a restaurant business. You know, and I spend most of my time focused on capital or investor base, M&A transactions to, you know, where we think there's opportunities to create value. Yeah. And I guess maybe if we, I mean, that's probably the key learning, but, you know, what are, I guess, from your um days as the manager what were kind of some of the common mistakes that you saw ceos making when they were you know looking for you guys to invest in them whether they're raising capital or just you know a non-deal roadshow just looking for new investors you know was it that inability to communicate the story or you know were there other things that they were doing you we were like you know, this is not really how to approach, I guess, the, the institutional market or maybe the, the market at all. Well, I mean, we were looking at companies that, you know, we were putting whatever, 250 to $500,000 investors. So we were focused on the lower end even of the, of the market and where, you know, we could actually get the CEO and the CFO on the phone and have a direct conversation with and our due diligence so i'm not here to suggest that they did anything wrong right because in the sense that the reason we were looking at them is because we thought they had built a good business that was doing well maybe not being properly reflected in terms of their price of their stock but in their a lot of times in their mind well we're not raising money so why do i care about stock price i'm the ceo and the cfo my shares are all restricted and can't be sold anyway. So they were taking much more of a long view than the market per se was giving them any credit for. So I don't necessarily say they were doing anything wrong, but you know, you do on the other hand, if you decided to go public 
and take in partners that are public shareholders. You do owe it to them to you know, tell the story to a, a point where your value is reflected and not wait till you know, the other side someday when you decide you wanna sell or decide maybe you wanna buy something. So you really do need to raise capital. So therefore you really do need your share price to that. And then, and then the other thing I think, you know, and I've experienced it on both sides back as micro cap manager in here, you know, there's a lot of pressure put on from the market of people who their mindset of an investment is I buy it at 930 this morning and I sell it before four o'clock at the end of the day, right? So you get too many of those phone calls or, I mean, I've literally had calls from you know, people who have bought one share of our company, a dollar, you know, with no commissions anymore. I mean, but they took the time to write me an email or make a phone call because they're pissed that they bought one share and it didn't go up, you know? So, so it's a tough, you know, in the micro cap space, you know, it's a tough market and you have to balance that. So I think the fact is, you know, we say on our website, you know, you know, I'm a big believer in sort of like this, you know, like Buffett does sort of the owner's manual, you know, we want to be, you know, cause we're in the restaurant space. We want to be the employer of choice cause we have to have great employees in order to operate. You know, we want to be the destination of a choice for customers that want to come to our stores. And then lastly, we do want to be the investment of choice. So, you know, that's, you know, what you have to try to keep drilling in the people, but you're never going to win. I mean, I literally woke up an email this morning from a shareholder that owns 1,500 shares, which is, you know, $750 worth of stock, you know, complaining because, you know, it hasn't gone up fast enough. And, um, you know, it's like, you know, I, I look at my list of shareholders and it fascinates me to see, you know, people, you know, buying and selling every day. And by the way, that's a valuable part of the market, right? That's, that does create liquidity. And, and, you know, I just finished reading the Larry Cunningham book on quality shareholders. And I have, you know, the three, my three interns reading it. We're going to come out with a white paper on it. But the fact is, and this is probably even more distorted in the micro cap market. I mean, the market today is really 15% of the market is what he deems of his research for ever is quality investors. And he, he, he says quality investors, somebody who's done due diligence, understands what they bought, realize they bought part of a business, think that from at least a year, they're going to own the stock and maybe for a long time if the company performs. And it's 15% of the market. Yeah. So, you know, you're, it's, 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 a, it's a slog every day, that's for sure. But you know what, we all, well, I don't know that everybody goes into it eyes wide open when they decide to go public, but you know, you need to have eyes wide open. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, uh, I kind of have been a bit vocal on uh, insider ownership and shareholder alignment and, you know, a lot of, a lot of people, you know, put that out there in the micro cap space because you tend to find more of it in the micro cap space where, you know, the CEO is generally the founder or there's a founding family and they, you know, have a lot in there. But, you know, sometimes that can turn into a bit of a, a Frankenstein monster where, you know, they are running it for the benefit themselves, not so much the minority public shareholders. I just wanted to get your take on it, for, you know, being a CEO and, uh, you know, a major holder on the insider and from the, the micro cap and a fund manager, hat or whatever, you know, your kind of overall view on, you know, having these shareholder aligned CEOs and, and boards. And um, because as we know, you know, when you get up into the mega caps, um, you know, you look, at, you look on Bloomberg, the top 20 shareholders are all endowments and Vanguard and BlackRock. Or, you know, you, you just, it, the CEO might own a lot of stock in dollar terms, but in terms of the market cap, you know, he'd be lucky if he's like 1%. Yeah, so I don't think there's an easy answer. So like I look at in my case, right? I mean, I've put over a million dollars into our stock. And it's obviously, I've never sold a share. I bought every quarter in my IRA. Does that really, at the end of the day, sway anyone to buy stock in the company? I don't think so. Secondly, you know, I have friends and family that own 
20 to 30 percent so that but that doesn't show up necessarily on insider ownership because they own four percent or three percent but if you aggregate them all together mm. it's significant i think more focus should be put on the making sure that whoever's running the company whatever economic interest they have is aligned with the shareholders and so if the shareholders win they send to win you know one of my favorite quotes is and i don't know if i attribute it to but i say it a lot is i my issue is i want people to be aligned where they have a mindset to make money with you versus off of you and as long as that mindset and the but you look at some of the most successful micro cap investments to your point Economic dollar wise, it was you know significant, but percentage wise, it wasn't necessarily you know a significant percentage. But in talking to them and meeting them, they lived, breathed. That's all they cared about, and and I was always gotten comfortable that you know that's the kind of guy I want to be partners with, or the woman, or management team, board. But as long as their incentives are aligned, you know. I'm fine, you know, with that. I think it's, I think you're right. There's no easy answer. And, uh, you know, I've done a bit of work on it myself. And, you know, I looked at taking Connor's uh, research where he, uh, Connor Haley from Alta Fox, who published yeah. a great white paper, uh, you know, some of the Australian names in there. I mean, it's a small subset of his overall one, but, you know, what the CEOs held at the start of his study and at the end. And I mean, basically it kind of showed you don't need these big insider ownerships to, you know, arrive at a multi-bagger uh, as, as Connor outlined in his, uh, his research. Sometimes it was there, but actually in the Australian sense anyway, uh, for a large case, you know, it didn't happen, but you had a CEO who, as you say, was passionate about, delivering for all shareholders and they stood to, you know, make um, a, a good economic return themselves. I, I don't have a problem with that at all. You know, if they're doing a job, they deserve to get paid well. And I think it's, yeah, I think it's, it's a great point you make. You want them who are incentivized to make money with you rather than, rather than off you. Um, and just the funny to... thing is about that same, that paper that you just referred to, which is an amazing paper. Um, I'm a big Connor fan. But, you know, one of the things I was fascinated by in that paper is that, you know, when he looked at the characteristics of the top performing stocks over the last, you know, five years, you know, 60% of them were companies that grew through acquisition and where they were able to, and they typically did smaller deals, you know, $10 million or less where it wasn't competitive. They weren't competing against private equity. There was a synergy. But when you aggregated them under the umbrella, you know, they truly got the economies of scale to, you know, from a G G and A and all that to, you know, put more to the bottom line that ultimately was reflected in the expansion of their multiple and the growth of the, you know, the, the bottom line cash flow. So, but no, that, that's, you know, I encourage anybody to go read that report. Connor's kind enough to, you know, put it on his website where anybody can read it. And, uh, you know, so it's a, it's a great report. Yeah, just on that point, it, it also flew in the face of the kind of conventional windism that, you know, M&A as a whole is value destructive, um, you know, which, you know, most people kind of just throw out and throw off the cuff in interviews, whereas, you know, Connor's thing uh, showed directly the opposite. But I think it. I think it, if you can do those more small tucking deals that aren't these, I always get very concerned when I see companies saying, you know, it's game changing or company making or you know where they're doing very large acquisitions. And if it turns out to be wrong, you know, the combined entity, you know, can really, really suffer. But I just wanted to go on to another point. I, I, if you were, I guess, um, you know, advising microcap analysts, uh, portfolio managers today, you know, from your experience, you know, kind of what are red flags to look out for or piece of advice you would give people, you know, um, in the micro cap space now of, for kind of lessons from the, from the front line that, that, that you've accumulated. Well, I mean, look, I think, 
you know, I mean, you got to trust your research, right? I mean, I think, you know, I just listened, you know, you know, two days ago to an interview with Monish Pabrai, who I, I think is you know, proven beyond. He's a very astute investor. And, uh, and, you know, he, he never, his big thing is never stop learning, right? So he's always learning. And he attributed, in fact, most of his big winners, multi-baggers, because he would look, he has his own list of his top 20 or 25 people in the industry that he respects. And if they come out and say they bought something, he looks at that company and then wants to understand why they bought it. And he acknowledged that when he saw Buffett buying GM coming out of the disaster, he was scratching his head and he did all his research, but in doing that research led him to one of his biggest multi-baggers, which was Fiat Chrysler. You know, so I think, you know, find people that you, you know, trust, admire their work, you know, and then study and ask yourself why. And then at the end of the day, there's a lot of ways to win in this game, figure out your own strategy and, and, and then trust your, you know, trust your research and, and making decisions and, you know, always, you know, trust but verify and continue and, and watch companies and make sure that they, you know, they do what they said they were going to do. Um, but you, you can make an, an unbelievable living by only being right, you know, a few times. And, uh, you know, in fact, they were talking about that, uh, I forgot his last name, Nicholas, he was talking about that one of the street, I think is his last name, you know, he, he has gotten, you know, did stupidly well, but in 2000, I think it was early 2010s, you know, he, he went to his LPs and said, I can keep writing you these letters, but it really doesn't make sense because I own three names. So I don't know how much more, and I'm never going to sell them, which was Amazon, um, uh, 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 one of the big uh, store chains. Uh, uh, excuse my mind, it's went blank. But there was three names. And he said, so why don't we just dissolve the fund and I'll you know, give you these three names because I'm never going to sell. You know, so, you know, he made three decisions and made, you know, obviously – gotten independently incredibly wealthy over just getting it right three times and uh so just trust your trust your research you know you know if you get punched in the stomach every once in a while you know cover your you know cover your your downside and uh and just keep keep trudging it's it's a great industry and uh and i'm convinced there's going to be companies that are little companies or thinking about going public or doing whatever today that we're going to look at five years from now, just like Connor did. And they're going to be companies that somebody made a lot of money in by getting it right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think Peter, Peter Thiel talks about in his book, uh, zero to one and uh, the power law of uh, investing and stuff where, you know, getting one or two right can basically cancel out you know 10 12 20 ones that you got wrong but it's just about finding those one or two and then holding those one or two i think ho- holding you know, hold, holding yeah. is 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 uh yeah. is, is definitely one of the one of the harder parts um and to your uh, point on you know the research and trusting your research when i worked at wilson asset management with jeff wilson who a lot of people will know is you know one of the die ends of funds management in Australia, you know, Jeff would always be, well, we, we just got to do the work. We just got to do the work. In other words, you know, we got to do the research and be as solid in our conviction about buying, holding or selling uh, as we could. Uh, and if we'd done the work and as you say, you know, it, it still turns out wrong. Um, you know, that's, that's just the nature of the beast. Uh, you know, as they say, uh, yeah. If nobody bats a thousand and definitely not in, not in the micro cap investing game. No, and you just got to learn, learn from those mistakes, survive those mistakes and stay in the game. You know, you know, I used, I used to tell people all the time that to me, I'm, of course, I'm probably prejudiced when it comes to this, but baseball is the greatest preparer for life and business because in baseball, if you don't figure out how to fail two out of three times, you're never going to succeed because the greatest hitters 
in baseball, you know, bat, you know, 300. And so, you know, you got to figure out how to fail and learn from it and get up there and swing the bat again. And, uh, and certainly you want to have a better bat and average in investing than 300. But <laughs> yeah. um, I think you have to have that mindset of, you know, you are going to be wrong some, some, and look, think about this. How many people this year is a great example of it, right? I, I, it, it breaks my heart in my industry, you know, that we're an investor and in. I'm an investor in other things, but in the, my primary investment and focus, the restaurant industry, I've watched people lose their life's work this year by no fault of their own. I mean, if, I mean, I, I, there's a guy who spent his life building 14 buffet style restaurants. He's in his seventies, wasn't levered hardly at all, but you know, here he is, that particular style of restaurant is pretty much closed down. I mean, you you know, buffet restaurants, you're not, they're all closed because of COVID. So I've watched a lot of people lose their life's work by no fault of their own this year in my industry or hotels. Think about this, the hotel industry. I mean, I mean, travel, you know, people who rely on, so it's, it's, you know, business is hard. I mean, it's really hard and things can come. So if you were an investor in, in these types of businesses, there's no way you could have foresaw what happened this year happened. And, you know, you got to, Hope you can survive it to get to the other side, and and uh, and hope you got enough winners to you know get you to the other side. Man. I mean, we are actively right now. We're on the other side because we got lucky by closing our deal. You know, we got six million in cash in. We cleaned up our balance sheet, and and uh, that we're looking to be a buyer, and we think this is the single best buying opportunity. Our M&A advisor and one of our big shareholders, it's all he does is restaurant deals, and he's probably one of the best at it. He you know, says this is the single best buying opportunity we've, they've seen in the industry in 15 years. You know, Things that we could have never afforded a year ago now are affordable. And if they're really good brands, like we've publicly said our little Big Burger brand, we actually have positive comp over, last, the, over 2019. Because we were lucky, Fred, who runs our business, um, we were early adapters into the loyalty program and the online and delivery and takeout. And so we've been lucky to, you know, to be, you know, a good place this year, but it's been tough for a lot of people in this space. Yeah, but I think, uh, you know, a lot of value investors, I'm sure, are doing uh, searching around in in the hotel space, the hospitality space more broadly, because, um, you know, there's going to be uh, some incredible bounce backs uh, and deals to be had and investments to be made in this space for when this, you know, hopefully passes in the next, if you take a, a medium term view of one to three years from now in a kind of a post vaccine world, um, you know, a lot of there's a lot of potential upside um, in the whole space. It's just about, yeah, I guess doing the work and trying to pick, you know, who's going to who's going to come out of this uh, and who isn't. Yeah, one look, one of the smartest investors I know, who luckily he's a small investor in us, but you know, he has called me half a dozen times over the last six months and have said i've been around a long time and when things like this happen where an industry is temporarily displaced somebody on the other side comes out made a lot of money and so if you're you know if you're going to raise capital to do something in an acquisition in this market if you don't call me i'm going to be quite upset you know so that's you know the mindset you know and uh but you know, it's, you know, you got to get it right. Right. I mean, you, you, you know, made it, you and I were talking about, you mentioned earlier about, you know, activist investors, you know, you, you got to get it, get it right. This first one. And you know, we're spending a lot of time making sure we get it right. And then if we have just speaking about the future, if we can crystal ball for, for a minute here, I mean, I'm sure you've seen a lot of 
changes in business and industry and investing over the last whatever let's call it 30 30 odd years i mean in the micro cap space you know what do you think are some of the structural changes or themes that you think are going to emerge in the space let's say in the next decade or so you know it, it, it's funny I, you know i am such a believer in in the free market and the you know capitalism and so you know it, there's i think there's always going to be you know the micro cap space and because you know that that emotion called greed right where there's there's like i said earlier there's going to be winners that have been created or came to the market in the last year there's going to be winners that's going to come to the market next year and the year after and the year after you know the key is finding those winners right but there's unfortunately in the micro cap space there's going to be losers too and but i think if you look at the pattern, you know, it, there'll be winners and those winners will perpetuate more people to give it a try and try to make it work. Um, you know, the one thing I did, but going back to the Alpha research is, you know, I've really spent zero time in my career of really looking at things outside of the United States, you know, in terms of from an investment perspective. And I think that was eye opening, you know, his report on there's a there's a big world out there, and uh, and there's things in the micro cap space being created. Australia, you know, where you know, you're you're focused on to, you know, markets in Europe. There's gonna be there's gonna be lots of winners. You know, that's that's like I say, I love entrepreneurism, and I love I'm very, you know, admiring of people who. Um, get out there and make it happen. And I'm sure there's, there's some great things that are gonna always come to be, over, over, like I say, for the next the foreseeable future. Yeah, well, we're and speaking going of... back to Peter Lentz, see, going back to Peter Lentz, you know, there's gonna be little companies that, you know, you know, hopefully, you know, that will certainly, not hopefully, will certainly grow up to be big companies. You know? Yeah. And, um... Yeah, but going back, I think I said at the time when Connor's report came out and the kind of the, um, what did I say, the attention that it got, I said the, 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 uh, the day of international microcap investing has arrived. And, you know, I said offline, but just before we started, the amount of inbound inquiry I've got from US microcap investors, both institutional and retail to a certain extent, uh, since Connor's report has, has been noticeable. And I think, you know, interactive brokers making it so easy now for, it doesn't matter if you're based in the UK or Australia uh, or the US, you know, they operate in all these markets, but they also give you access to, you know, most developed world markets uh, and with brokerage being driven down so low or non-existent in some cases, you know, to, to look and invest in micro cap stocks internationally, even compared, I would say, to five years ago, is much, much more feasible for your average retail investor now. And I think that is going to be one of the huge changes that we're going to see in micro cap investing in the next decade, in my view, is the internationalization by retail investors in micro cap investing. I mean, it's already happened in the large caps with ETFs and even direct, you know, people buying Tesla, for example, from all over as, as a standalone stock rather than just owning it in a, in a NASDAQ ETF or S&P ETF. I think, you know, micro cap international investing is, is one of the big themes I see coming true in the next decade. I don't disagree. I uh, look and like I say, if some of our online, you mentioned interactive brokers, but I mean, some of our other online, like Schwab and TD Ameritrade, the bigger, and even Robinhood, um, if you know, they make it easier, then I really think that would also, and I, and I think they will, so that also perpetuate. And I agree with you. Uh, um, which is good for the micro cap space because it just brings you know, a bigger pool of liquidity right across the, you know, the whole, the whole market, uh, Australians investing in the US, US coming to Australia, you know, it's, it's all improves uh, liquidity right across the market so that, you know, you get, 
uh, hopefully one of your stocks benefiting from uh, somebody seeing value from uh, from outside that market because I find you know in the micro cap market I think you might have kind of hit the nail on the head you know people are very domestically focused and you can get caught up in the kind of I don't know the the uh, feeling within the whole market and you know they just attract a certain p to this sector or, or these types of companies but if you're looking at it from outside people are say there's value here this is cheap when we compare it to us multiples or uk multiples and i think it, it'll bring a, a, a lot more price and value discovery the internationalization of microcap investing i agree i think you're, you're right on um Okay, Mike, I think we're, we're going to leave it there. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Um, thank you very much for joining us. If anybody wants to get in touch about Emergent or um, anything else that you're up to, um, what's the best way to get in contact with you? So uh, my email at Emergent is mp, like for Mike Pruitt, mp, at Emergent, A-M-E-R-G-E-N-T, H-G, for hospitality group, dot com. So emergenthg.com. And uh, my cell phone number is 704-578-2238. I uh, am always available and reply to all emails and, and messages. So I, I appreciate this opportunity and keep up the great work and uh, look forward to following you and continue to follow what your work is all about. Cheers. Thanks, Mike. And I'll just say on the, on the cell phone number, to, it's a plus one in front of that for the country code for the US if anybody's contacting you from Australia. Mike, listen, we'll, we'll okay. leave it there. Thank you very much. And um, yeah, I hope uh, some of the Coffee Microcaps audience have got some value out of uh, our conversation today. I think it was you know, very interesting to hear from both sides, the CEO side and the uh, and the, the fund manager side, and I guess somebody who's who's been around this, uh, the micro cap space for so long, uh, all the, the the few war stories that were in there. All right, buddy. I appreciate okay. it. Man. Thanks, Mike. Thank you.